Ted's presence had been requested at the seaside villa rented by his sister Marjorie in Sussex. Marjorie's husband Walter was an overworked surgeon who, feeling on the brink of breakdown, had self-prescribed an extended break of complete rest. One fortnight into his month's rest cure, in a rented house called The Firs, near the remote village of Coltham, Walter's vitality was returning and he had suggested that Ted join them in the clifftop abode. On his arrival there, Ted was told by the servant that Marjorie and Walter had gone out for a walk and he wandered around admiring the spacious farmhouse. He was particularly taken by the Bernstein grand piano, which he imagined his gifted sister had already played. Despite the hot day, this room was cool, in fact quite chilly, he noticed, an observation with which Walter agreed when the pair returned from their walk. In fact, Walter, with unusual vehemence, insisted that the room was bitterly cold, even though the thermometer was saying that it was warm. Marjorie later took Ted aside when she decided to walk down a track to swim at the beach. She said that, Although Walter was much better, he had at least 20 times that day alluded to that strange feeling of chill in the big room. In fact, that there was definitely something odd about the room. Ted wondered why he was only just talking about it. Hadn't he experienced it before? Marjorie explained that until that day, the room had been locked and shuttered, that they had been told by the gardener caretaker called Denton that the owner stored things in it and it was to be left closed. Finally, Walter had told Denton that it was nonsense to keep the largest room in the house shut up and had demanded the key. Denton had not wanted to disobey the owner, but when Walter insisted, finally produced the key. There was nothing stored in the room and Marjorie had even driven to the agents to ask if there was any such order. None at all. Ted wondered if perhaps Denton did not want the bother of dusting and airing the room and then cleaning up after the couple's stay. Or perhaps the owner was wanting to prohibit the playing of the grand piano. Marjorie went quiet, as if uneasy, and finally admitted that both of them felt that there was something strange about the whole house. They found themselves looking up to see who was in the room and hearing strange noises. Ted returned to the house thinking how unlike his sister it was for her to be in the grip of such unexplained apprehension or to imagine that there was anything odd about the house. He found his books and papers on a big table in the lately open sitting room and was quickly engrossed in the memoir he was writing, the chill of the room soon forgotten. Suddenly aware that he was not alone, he glanced up to see a man outside the window gazing fixedly at the piano. This was obviously Denton. Ted asked if he wanted anything and received the strange reply that he was just looking to see if the room was all right before moving away. Ted thought that he was really checking on the piano. Ted found himself unable to do further work as he still sensed some presence in the room. Glancing around, and perhaps infected by Denton's example, he looked at the piano's white and ebony keys and saw there that some of them were moving. A group, three or four at a time, and now a succession of single notes, sank and recovered, as if under the pressure of fingers. Indescribable curiosity and dismay filled Ted's mind. He gazed fascinated at this inexplicable movement, but at the same time his mind cried out in horror at the invisible cause of it. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, the fantastic spectacle ceased, but the presence was still there. There came the sound of steps as Walter entered looking for Marjorie, then asked Ted, Was it you playing then? On hearing that Ted had not touched the piano, he looked puzzled and said he would swear that he had heard playing. Ted instantly decided not to tell Walter what he had seen, 
feeling self-doubt, but also intense curiosity and a deep, unreasoning terror. The next day, Ted awoke, remembering why the name of this town had seemed so familiar to him. Last year, an unsolved, brutal crime had taken place in Coltham, when an elderly spinster lady, living with her spinster sister, had succumbed to an intruder. It was supposed that robbery was the motive for the crime, but the murderer seemed to have heard some stir in the house and left a cash box containing forty pounds in the drawer they had just opened. Ted could remember no further details, but decided to stroll over to Coltham that morning and satisfy a ghoulish desire to identify the house. After a walk, he found a bunch of cottages on the edge of the downs and decided that a rather stricken-looking house with a to let sign up was a probable site for the heinous crime. He suddenly spotted Denton coming towards him down the street and asked him which was the house where the incident had taken place. Nervously, Denton pointed to the one Ted had picked out and, when asked the name of the elderly lady, said, abruptly, Miss Ellishaw, and walked on. Feeling smug about his own powers of deduction, Ted strolled homeward again. Back at the Furs, Ted found his sister in the piano room writing letters and paying overdue bills, which included rent on the house for the next fortnight. Marjorie apologised for muddling up Ted's papers with her letters on the large table, and as he helped her disentangle them, he came across a cheque she had drawn for the house rental. It was made out to a Miss Ellishaw. So the owner of the house was the sister of the murder victim, who had perhaps also lived with her in the house in Coltham. In the meantime, Marjorie had found a book of English songs in the cupboard, although the very song she wanted to play on the piano, Home Sweet Home, was the only page missing. She knew the old-fashioned tune off by heart and began to play it as Ted observed Denton out in the garden picking sweet peas. Ted watched as he dropped his basket and stopped his ears, and simultaneously Ted was again aware of a presence there in the room, neither his nor Marjorie's. Walter looked in at the door and seemed relieved to see that it was Marjorie who was playing, although he also suddenly became aware of the presence, and Marjorie stopped playing. In a moment of absolute and appalling silence, all three were aware of some invisible force gaining strength from their recognition of its existence. The silence was broken as all three began to chatter nervously and prepare for their dinner guest, the local vicar, Mr Bird. After the meal, Ted lit Mr Bird's walk back to the village with a lantern, while of course questioning him about the tragedy that had occurred the year before. Ted wondered aloud if the incident had actually occurred at the Furs, given that Miss Ellishaw was the owner, and his theory was confirmed by Mr Bird. The vicar said that Miss Ellishaw did not want the public to know the gruesome connection, as she did not want to live in the house again and wanted to let it. Denton was aware of her wishes and therefore would have deliberately pointed out the wrong house. While not mentioning the strange phenomena witnessed by himself and the others, Ted learned that the piano room held terrible memories for those in the house at the time, which probably explained its having been locked up. Back at the house, Ted surmised the tragic events, as Miss Ellishaw, having been playing Home Sweet Home on the piano when she met her end, perhaps later discovered by Denton. Certainly that afternoon, the fragment of the tune which Marjorie had played gave Denton a sudden shock of horror. The others having gone upstairs, Ted sat outside in the stillness despite a gathering storm. He slowly became aware of, faint but distinct, the tinkle of the piano. A couple of bars of the familiar tune were played before a voice, thin and quavering, began to sing the air. Curious, Ted took the lamp to the piano room, 
which was empty, although he saw that once more the keys were moving as the tune and singing continued. A sense of fear and powerlessness invaded his mind, holding him there. Something like a mist or greyness began to form and slowly solidify into the figure of a small white-haired woman who sat with her back to him. Suddenly the singing stopped, her arms shot up with quivering, clutching fingers, and she was struggling. Her body swayed until she slid off the music stool to the floor. At that moment a blaze of light poured through the windows and Ted saw, pressed against the pane and seemingly unaware of his presence, Denton's white and staring countenance. Simultaneously with the light came a terrifying crack of thunder as the storm burst. For a moment Ted and Denton faced each other before his feet were heard running down the garden path. Another flash in the gross darkness revealed him sprinting across the down to the white edge of the cliffs as the rain suddenly burst from the sky. The prodigious storm streamed and rattled all night before Ted finally slept deeply, then awoke to a tranquil and sunny morning. Strangely, the house seemed as wholesome as the breeze from the sea. The piano room where Ted had witnessed the ghastly pageantry now seemingly rid of its tragic stain. Strolling through the garden as he waited for the others to rise, Ted saw the vicar advancing along the paved walk. Mr Bird told Ted that a very dreadful thing had happened. Denton's lifeless form had been found at the foot of the cliff. He was thought to have fallen sheer onto the rocks below. Given his strange experiences in the piano room at the Firs, Ted found himself piecing together the circumstances of the horrendous crime that had taken place there. That the calming of the eerie phenomena coincided with Denton's unexplained demise suggested his possible involvement. However, that would never be known.